It's shocking, isn't it? Hello, welcome to Plugged In on Voice of America. I'm Greta Van Susteren, and this week, an 11-year-old boy reportedly hacked into an imitation of a Florida state voting website, changing the theoretical election results. Now, he did his hacking in less than 10 minutes, and while the accuracy of the imitation site has been challenged, this experiment does highlight the very real impact that just one hacker, this time a young person, can have both nationally and globally. Cybercrime threatens not only our security and the integrity of electoral process, it's also very expensive. According to experts, global cybercrime costs are projected to hit $6 trillion a year by 2021. And an attack last year on the Equifax Credit Bureau in the United States, hackers stole the social security numbers and other personal information of nearly 150 million Americans. U.S. Vice President Mike Pence recently announced a new cybersecurity push in response to the 2016 election interference here in the United States and due to other concerns. Our goal remains. American security will be as dominant in the digital world as we are in the physical world. The Pentagon alone repels about 36 million malicious emails. But the problem of cyber attacks, it's much bigger than the United States. It is a worldwide crisis. So where are the attacks originating? According to Security Today magazine, in 2017, 41% of cyber attacks originated in China, 20% originated in Turkey, 17% in the United States, 8% in Brazil, and 4% in Russia. Other countries were responsible for 9% of cyber attacks. The countries most affected by cyber attacks were Indonesia, followed by the Philippines, India, the United States, Turkey, and Brazil. In this program, you're going to hear from a hacker, an African cybersecurity specialist, and a tech journalist. But first, to talk about the national security implications of cyber warfare, Kim Zetter. She covers cybersecurity for Wired Magazine and is author of the book Countdown to Zero Day Stuxnet, and a launch of the world's first digital weapon. Nice to see you, Kim. Thank you. All right, first of all, we think of weapons of mass destruction like nuclear weapons or bio, bio or chemical weapons. Um, now we have cyber warfare. Is, is that a weapon, potentially a weapon of mass, disaster, mass destruction in your mind? Uh, mass destruction, I'm not sure. I think that what we'll see is um, uh, cyber uh, digital weapons used in conjunction with kinetic weapons. Um, but in terms of a digital weapon causing mass destruction, uh, probably not. All Certainly right. not, not death. All right. Your book talks about a worm, a virus that's a worm, which is different than hacking. So give us a little basic education as to what a, what a worm is as opposed to something like hacking. So a worm uh, is um, it's like a virus, except with a virus you need to actually click on something like an attachment to get your, your machine infected. A worm, however, will travel um, uh, between con uh, machines that are connected by a network uh, without the user having to do anything. So once it's on my computer, let's say, um, if I'm on a company network, it will travel within that network to other people uh, within that network without me or them having to do anything. Um, in this case, it was a worm that was designed by the U.S. and Israel to attack a system, a, a facility in Iran um, uh, uh, uranium enrichment plant outside of a village called Natanz. And, and the malicious uh, code was designed to cause centrifuges there that were enriching uranium hexafluoride gas to cause the centrifuges to spin out of control. How did Iran get wind of the fact that there was a worm in their system? <laughs> well, they didn't uh, initially. Um, the, the worm was discovered outside of the Natanz facility. It started to spread and it caused some computers to crash and reboot and crash and reboot and the owners of those computers then contacted their antivirus company which was a, a company in Belarus um, and they um, searched the computers and they found some suspicious files and they made those files available to the rest of the cyber, secu cyber security community around the world and some researchers at the US company, US based company Symantec started taking it apart and it took them four months to actually reverse engineer it and figure out what it was designed to do. And that's really then what tipped Iran off to the fact that this uh, malicious code was in their, in their system. Was the worm designed to delay the Iranian nuclear weapons program or was it de designed to be destructive? 
Well, so Iran maintains that it wasn't a nuclear weapons program, that it was a domestic uh, nuclear program. Um, the U.S. and the Western countries say it was a weapons program. It was designed uh, primarily to buy time for sanctions to work uh, in order to push um, Iran to the negotiating table. Uh, the weapon wasn't designed to cause uh, one-time catastrophic damage of all of the centrifuges. It was designed to cause incremental damage over time to sort of retard the system and keep the Iranians in place while diplomacy and sanctions could work. All right. Now, this is a little bit different than, I mean, typically, at least I think of like hacking is how do I protect myself from hacking as a defensive mood. This was much more of an offensive yeah. mood, a move. So I take it, I mean, is this going on around the world by many governments are actually using it offensively? Yeah. So we don't know um, how many governments in the past prior to Stuxnet uh, engaged in this kind of activity. My research, um, I I initially went into the research thinking that this could not have been the first offensive weapon that the U.S. launched. Um, and I came away from the research thinking that it actually was, primarily because it takes a lot of um, effort to get past the legal hurdles in the U.S. Uh, in order to launch something like this, due to the, um, the kind of collateral damage it can cause. Uh, but that doesn't mean that other countries weren't already engaging in this. You know, we often see explosions in pipelines and other facilities, and the explanations um, don't quite match what's happened. So there are instances that we that, that have happened in the past that we don't know if they were digital attacks or if they were mere accidents or something. Um, but certainly post-Stuxnet, a lot of countries have announced uh, plans to engage in offensive operations on their own. Um, so I think we'll see a lot of more of this going forward. Any idea what North Korea is up to in terms of offensive? Well, North Korea isn't a big player in this area yet. Um, you know, they've been engaging. Uh, we've had some attacks that have been attributed to North Korea, like the Sony hack and the WannaCry worm. Um, but they haven't caused um, the kind of physical destruction of, of, let's say, of physical equipment. They've caused damage to computers. Um, but Stuxnet was designed to leap outside of the digital world into the physical world and cause damage not to computers, but to the equipment that the computers were controlling. So it's an entirely different kind of attack, um, and we don't see that I Iran having that capability yet. All right, you say yet. I mean, that's always... Uh, sorry, you know, North Korea. Uh, yes, I knew I'm in North Korea, but you haven't said that you say yet. Is it possible that things are being sort of seeded into our, our, let's say, the domestic U.S. computer system that in the event that something needed to happen, they essentially could pull the trigger and do damage? Are there things that sort of can sneak into our system that we're not even aware of? Yes. Um, so there are things that we call like a logic bomb. A logic bomb is something that will sit in a network silently. Um, it might be programmed to go off at a certain time on a certain date or when a certain event happens. Um, or it can just sit there silently waiting for commands. Um, but the problem with planting something like that when you don't know when you're going to use it is that at any time um, that malware, um, that malicious code can be undone. Uh, let's say if the system gets disconnected from the internet or if it gets patched or reconfigured, it can essentially disable that. So um, even setting something up in advance, in a, in a long time advance of something, just to have that capability later on doesn't necessarily help the adversary. But do we know if it exists? I mean, but at least right now, uh, we're possible with theoretically any nation can be sort of a sitting duck for any of that until it's yeah. changed or patched or becomes obsolete for some reason. Yeah, we can, we can assume that there are adversaries in some critical infra infrastructure networks, um, just like we can assume that the U.S. is also sitting on critical infrastructure networks overseas. Kim, thank you very much. Great book, great read. Thank you. Thank you. According to the U.S.-based news website CNBC.com, a breach in 2013 at web searcher Yahoo where 3 billion user accounts were compromised was the largest hack in U.S. history. Second on that list, 2014, a Russian group known as CyberVor hacked into the sites of multiple email providers and social media and websites, obtaining personal information on 1.2 billion users. Other huge hacks included FriendFinder, MySpace, and the Republican National Committee. Joining us from St. Louis, Missouri, to talk about these hacks and others, Vinny Troya, and he is what is called a white hack white hat hacker. Hacking since he was 10 years old, Vinny now hacks into businesses to discover their security weaknesses. Nice to see you, Vinny. Thanks, Greta. Thanks for having me back on. Vinny, uh, explain a little bit more what this white hat hacker is. Well, essentially, it's, it's just like you described. I mean, companies will pay me or pay us for services to try to break into their systems and bypass their defenses. And as a result of that, we will provide them with uh, information on what we found, and which will allow them to 
patch their vulnerabilities so that the hackers don't get to it before they do. All right, let me give you the list of the top five industries at risk of cyber attacks in over 100 countries. Healthcare, manufacturing, financial services, government, transportation. That all sounds scary to me. But let me just ask you to start with financial services since the FBI has issued some sort of warning that there may be a global cash grab from ATMs, um, which, I, which I assume is a hacking of some sort. Uh, but tell me, how at risk are banks? I'd say banks are obviously the primary target because that's where the money is. I've also seen uh, a number of banks, you know, here in the U.S. specifically, really beef up their security. I mean, there's a lot of regulations surrounding the information security of banks, so I think there's a lot of uh, safeguards put in place now. But if you look at banks around the world, traditionally, when you see um, big cash outs and, and big ripoffs occurring, it's uh, they're occurring with banks happening overseas. So. Even though the regulations are maybe more stringent here in the U.S., there are certainly banks all over the world that are getting hit pretty regularly. All right, aviation. I fly a lot, so naturally, uh, you know, I'm alarmed by the at the thought that, uh, besides other things being hacked into, like banking and healthcare, but that uh, that aviation could be hacked into because I assume that would create incredible havoc. Um, is it? And I don't know if you can quantify it this way, but is it easy to hack into these uh, aviation uh, corporations or into banking? Um, I mean, I guess it all depends on skill level. I mean, sometimes you, you get, honestly, sometimes you just kind of get lucky and you find the door wide open, which is what happens a lot of the times with these big hacks. I know uh, there was a gentleman, Chris Roberts, who um, was able to hack into an airline a few years back just by plugging into one of the uh, ports under the seat. And so nobody saw that coming, but he was able to access the airline controls or the airplane's, uh, you know, uh, manual controls. And so obviously that caused a big stir. But so when you look at it from that way, I mean, he was able to simply just plug in. And so I guess some people would consider that easy, sure. But he had the, you know, the, the knowledge to just go about and do it. So I think it comes down to more of a question of, you know, what's the motivation to do it and, you know, the willingness to do it. What scares you? Um, you know, this whole Bitcoin thing is interesting. Uh, I think um, no one really understands really how a lot of Bitcoin, a lot of people don't understand how Bitcoin really works. And so with all these new currencies coming out, you know, where's the money really? I mean, who's actually holding it and, and how are the funds, you know, being secured and transferred? I think that's, um, I think we're seeing more and more uh, Bitcoin um, agencies being hacked. And, and that's probably where things are heading at this point. What about the New York Stock Exchange? Um, is that, I mean, are, are all those companies that are on the exchange, I realize it's giants, huge, but is, are they pretty much ahead of the game and secure, or is that a real reason, is that a real vulnerable spot? Uh, it's always going to be a vulnerable spot, but as far as the New York Stock Exchange, I've actually done work with them before. I mean, they, they host um, a few um, live simulations annually where they have people come in and actually try to hack in under live circumstances to make sure that there's nothing going on. So I think the, the stock exchange is pretty secure at this point. Um, but that's not to say that, you know, someday someone might not just leave the door wide open. It, I mean, it certainly has happened before. What about that 11-year-old who at least they think that he could, they, in this hypothetical or imitated website, could uh, hack into the electoral website in Florida? Well, I mean, that was really cool. I mean, you know, so the DEF CON conference just ended and they had these, um, this hack, this voting hacking village or this voting machine hacking village. And I mean, the 11 year old was literally the first person that was able to go into the system and, and modify the tally, which a number of other people did. And there were actually some videos floating around. Uh, a reporter did a video on how easy it was to, to apply the same techniques. And I think it took her all of about six minutes to do. So regardless of what they're saying on whether or not this was an accurate hack or whether or not it was an accurate representation of the voting booths, I mean, the point is an 11 year old still did it. And it's, it's something that needs to be addressed. Vinny, nice to see you again. Thank you. It's been a long time. <laughs> Cyber attacks are a global problem and securing against them requires a global solution. That means working with allies worldwide. Ambassador Omar Aruna is managing partner at U.S. Africa Cybersecurity Group and former ambassador of Benin to the United States. He works on securing digital assets around Africa. Nice to see you, sir. Hello, Rita. All right, explain to me, since we're now a global economy, what happens if a bank in an African nation gets hacked? Well, you see, when the bank in African nation get hacked, uh, it destabilizes the whole world uh, uh, financial system. That's one thing. I'll give you a simple example. 
in uh, Nigeria currently, I think all the major U.S. Uh, uh, oil companies are working in Nigeria. They're investing in stock over there. They invest about $3.5 million billion in stock over there. Think about that a bank or a financial system in Nigeria get uh, a hat and all that uh, investment is a loss. Obviously, there is a repercussion for those uh, major oil uh, uh, company. So that's some of the things that can happen easily when you're talking about cybersecurity abroad. That's the that's direct financial cost of bank. What about what does it do to destabilizing a nation such as Nigeria? Oh, destabilizing the nation, you know, is uh, finance is always a, de a destabilizing factor in any economy. And you think about that, uh, there is people don't get paid, there is a riot in the, uh, uh, on the street. Uh, and the next thing you know, uh, things are out of hand. Government is topple, and if it's a friendly government to the U.S., then it's another issue, which is a big diplomatic issue. And let us assume that during that period of time, there is a major vote that uh, is taking place uh, at the uh, 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 U.N. Security Council, and then the U.S. needs that vote. It's gone. So basically, we're not. No one's alone. We're no, all we're all we, interconnected with each other. We're all at this interconnected, point. and uh, you know the weakest link is always the door for disaster. And we need to face the weakest link. Where, uh, where, where's the weakest spot in terms of as you, as you look at this, in, like it's on the African continent? What worries you the most about cybersecurity? If I tell you that, out of 54 countries in Africa, only. 20% uh, percent I mean, 30 of them don't have any cybersecurity uh, uh, regulation. No, non -zero. zero. Non zero. And could they could they impact other parts of the world? Obviously, yes, because uh, uh, you have uh, these countries who are part of the uh, concert of nation and the active economies that contribute to the world. And they think about it also. Uh, Africa has the, uh, the fastest growing economy in the world. And uh, so, yes, there is a major impact just overlooking Africa. And those, and, and those are the countries that don't have any cybersecurity at all? Yes. And is, are other nations at least trying to step in and help them implement cybersecurity? Because it's going to affect everybody if it, they have a problem. It, it, it will affect everybody. But then again, in Africa, when you say cybersecurity, uh, you're talking about the one who have some cybersecurity is uh, not really adequate. It's just uh, below standard. I'm, I'm not even talking about below standard. I'm talking about under below standard. So we're talking about cybersecurity as something that can uh, uh, is not one, one size fit all. However, we lack in behind in Africa, no regulation. So here in the United States, we could have great cybersecurity, offensively, defensively. We could do what we could to fight against hacking, virus, worms. But if Africa is not secure or some other part of the world, we're not secure. You're not secure at all. You're not secure at all. Uh, they, there is a broadband that goes around Africa. In Tanzania, for example, there is a lot of uh, U.S. multinationals that are out there and working. If a, a, a hacker or a cyber criminal need to access headquarters here, they can use uh, the uh, multinational uh, uh, offices uh, 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 on the ground to attack the U.S. So nobody is secure unless everybody is secure. Ambassador, uh, nice to talk to you, but of course you've scared me. <laughs> yes, <laughs> nice definitely. to talk to you, sir. <laughs> well, huge hacks are the most direct way governments can declare cyber war on each other. Everyday citizens, well, they face a further threat to their privacy. Facebook, as well as Twitter and Google's YouTube, have become the digital arms dealers of the modern age, wrote the New York Times technology columnist and co-founder of the tech site Recode, Kara Swisher. I asked her what she meant. It was a column I did in the New York Times. I started to write op-ed pieces of them for them about tech. And so I wanted to start with a bang, I guess. Um, but the concept was that these people have been providing tools to all kinds of bad actors, and not just bad actors, but all kinds of trolls and different things like that. And they you mean by these, you mean social media? Social media, like Facebook, uh, Reddit, um, Twitter, which have been in the news this week for Alex Jones, but before for Cambridge Analytica, the Russians using the platform. And by the way, the Russians weren't hacking. They were using the tools in the way they were meant to be used. So you can't even call it hacking. They just use them. And so when they have this much information, and they have so much information, not just that, there'll be DNA information, there's going to be eye information, there's going to be location information. When these companies have this much 
uh, information, and they, they become quasi-governments in, in a weird ways. But they don't want to, again, have the responsibilities that governments have to its citizens. And so, uh, you know, look, spying is going to go on forever. It's since the beginning of time. Do you really trust these companies to protect your privacy? And that's really the question. I, I don't. All right, that's your privacy. What about cybersecurity? I mean, people, right. are people at, at some sort of risk? Well, if they couldn't protect the information that went out to Cambridge Analytica, do you really trust them to protect you from people who are really intent on stealing the information? I don't know. But the fact of the matter is we've created all these systems without thinking of the safeguards that need to be in place. And the minute you try to put safeguards in, they accuse you of First Amendment, they accuse you of censorship, they accuse you of this. It, it is, you cannot do bad things in life either. And you cannot sort of sully, if you're making a product, sullying the product with these people makes it a worse product. It's like being in a city and all of a sudden there's broken glass everywhere. And if they want to create a city and they want to run it, they have to run it the way they need police, they need firemen, they need all kinds of things. Do you see any risks at all, this sort of big picture, like our banking system or Everything. anything? Everything. So this is, this is a, this is a cybersecurity risk to our banking um, our, well, uh, it's already it's already under siege everywhere. You know, if you you know, there's all kinds of different really interesting technology around blockchain and and others that they're trying to reform this and trying to figure out ways to do it. There is always going to be bad actors. People are always going to try to rob a bank wherever it happens to be. That's because that's where the money is, right? And so the, as we start to shift things um, and we start to move to everything online and to everything in the cloud, we've got to really pay attention to the to the consequences. And I think what happened is you have a bunch of people in Silicon Valley who literally do not think of the impact of the creations they've made and they don't want to be responsible for them. Don't and care? No, I, I, it's, it's, it's too easy to say that. Don't think about it. Now those of you who have been following Plugged In know that press freedom is a topic we discuss routinely here and is specifically protected in the U.S. Constitution. It's vital to freedom. Press is not free, though, in many parts of the world, and today's story about lack of press freedom hits close to home for Voice of America. Authorities in China arrested two VOA Mandarin service reporters. They were arrested while conducting an interview with Su Wen Guan, a Chinese citizen who had two weeks earlier also been arrested and subsequently released for speaking to Voice of America. The two VOA reporters have likewise now been released, and one of those reporters, VOA correspondent Yubing Feng, joins us. Nice to see you, and I'm delighted that you're out. Hi, nice to see you too. So what happened? Yeah, uh, you know, we have uh, broadcasted uh, uh, the uh, news about uh, Professor Sun Guang for about two weeks. Uh, Sun Guang uh, was, uh, you know, a, active uh, critic of uh, Chinese government and uh, its uh, policy, uh, you know, uh, against uh, the uh, over uh, the uh, universal uh, values uh, for a long period of time, but, uh, probably uh, 20 years, 30 years. And uh, it was recently uh, invited to uh, VOA's uh, uh, Mandarin TV show uh, uh, live to uh, talk about uh, uh, Chinese leaders' uh, policy uh, for uh, investment overseas. Uh, he uh, just called the uh, policy as just money throwing uh, and very risky. Uh, he said it was not uh, appropriate uh, to do that overseas while uh, so many people in China are still uh, struggling under the poverty line. Uh, just then, uh, he was stopped by some uh, secret police uh, who uh, broke into his home uh, to uh, interfere uh, with the uh, in live interview with the VOA. Uh, and then uh, shortly, uh, he was uh, not heard of uh, uh, from then on. And we tried to contact him by all means, uh, but uh, there was no uh, response from his uh, cell phone or from his uh, landline phone uh, or email or uh, uh, Skype, 
nothing. So uh, we try to uh, uh, follow uh, his whereabouts, you know, for many days. Uh, we uh, went to, uh, you know, uh, my colleague Alan and I personally went to uh, Jinan, uh, Mr. Uh, Sun's hometown, to uh, check out, you know, at his uh, apartment. Uh, but we found nothing. And uh, his neighbor told us uh, he probably uh, was uh, put under house arrest at a, a hotel or something. And uh, the it, last weekend, we heard that uh, Professor Sun and his wife were put back home again, still under uh, and, severe and, and if I may. And if I may stop, that that video we have is then when you, that we have is you actually trying to talk to him, and then you were detained. And what happened to you? Yes, yeah, just you know, uh, we arrived uh, at his uh, apartment uh, to uh, see you know if uh, he was really put back home, uh, and we, we you know we found him home, but. Uh, uh, Quite a number of uh, secret police uh, and uh, plainclothes men uh, were still at his door watching him. So we just tried to, uh, you know, have an interview with him. Uh, and uh, my colleague Alan uh, started uh, uh, live streaming uh, on Twitter uh, at the uh, moment. And uh, Professor Sun told his experience uh, for the last uh, uh, 10 days or so, uh, where, you know, uh, where he was put was, uh, you know, uh, four hotels, you know, at each hotel, they were staying there just for a couple of days. And uh, the police uh, tried to ask the, them to, uh, 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 to make a statement to publish a statement telling uh, people that they were traveling, they were on a tour, but uh, they refused. And and in a line, and of course, then you were and in custody, then, and you were taken into custody, and if I can just sort of jump ahead, not to yeah. cut you off because we're running out of time, but um, you have now been released, thankfully, but it just once again puts a spotlight um, on the fact that there aren't press freedoms around the world and that we have it here in the United States, and uh, as noted, you know, I'm delighted you and your colleague are out, um, and uh, we're very lucky here in the United States for the free press. That's all the time we have for today. Stay tuned by liking us on Facebook and Voice America. You can also like my Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Greta and follow me on Twitter at Greta. Thanks for being plugged in.